Kia ora koutou. Greetings and welcome to Our Regenerative Future, Webisode 5. Lessons from around the world. Our regular host and author of Our Regenerative Future, Alina Siegfried, is out sick today, so she's thankfully assisting me uh, from behind the scenes with Ursula of Pure Advantage. My name is Simon Miller. I'm the executive director of Pure Advantage and producer of Our Regenerative Future, an investigation into the science and business behind the growing mindset shift that is regenerative ag. Pure Advantage produced this series with Edmund Hillary Foundation, who have just closed their eighth cohort recruitment of impact change makers, focused on building solutions to global challenges. They are now moving on to the next phase of this journey by activating the impact of the fellowship in New Zealand. Just a quick bit of housekeeping, uh, please place your questions in the chat box and don't get dismayed if yours doesn't get answered because we will post them to our Instagram feed in the very near future to keep this important conversation going. We're now recording live and sharing on Facebook. And with that, let's welcome our guests from around the world. A big thank you to our panelists. I'll mention your name and a short bio. And if you could please respond with a brief introduction about your current work and what regenerative agri agriculture means to you. We keep that to a couple of minutes each, that will be great. I'll start with Aaron. Aaron is a former farm kid from the Canadian prairies who calls both Canada and New Zealand home. She spent 20 years building local, organic and regenerative supply chains and now works to accelerate the adoption of regenerative farming education and know-how, putting the power back into the hands of the producer. Aaron, welcome. Thank you so much. So I'm in from, I'm in Lyle Bay, Wellington right now. So Canadian in New Zealand and happy to be here. Um, right now I'm working on a project in Canada. We are creating a decentralized education hub in the prairies where the farmers themselves will be trained in land monitoring to measure regeneration so that we can see how those monitorings can be used to change policy and to enter different supply chains. So I'm working on that end in Canada and using those learnings here in New Zealand to see how we might be able to support, once again, the uptake of farmer knowledge to move to regenerative practices. Great, thank you very much. Nicole, I'll swing over to you. Nicole is the founder of Integrity Soils and joins us from the big skies of Idaho. Nicole has been providing knowledge and leadership around ag ecology to producers in the US, Canada, and across Australasia for over two decades. We've been fortunate to have had Nicole back in New Zealand before COVID. She's the author of the must read for the love of soil. Nicole, welcome. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for pulling this together. Um, and thanks for the plug. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, my work currently, uh, it seems with COVID, I've gone back to more of the one on one working with um, ranchers and farmers, like on the ground. Whereas before COVID, COVID I was just flying really in terms of workshops. So right now I am in Idaho at Older Spring Ranch, which is an, an inspiration for what's possible on some of these real dry land environments in terms of animal impact and bringing life back to landscapes. And that really is what regenerative agriculture is to me, is how do we bring back more vibrancy and see fully functional systems with water holding capacity and nutrient cycles and, and growing just you know the best produce that we possibly could so for me regenerative out uh, regenerative is all about the outcomes great thank you moving on to Selene uh, Selene Diaris is the founder and executive director of at the epicenter based in Boulder Colorado she is recognized for helping to galvanize the global regenerative movement by convening thought leaders from business civic academia and agricultural networks for shared solutions to extractive models in the food, fashion and beauty industries. She is a former White House intern in Better White House Days and I'm proud to say <laughs> I've attended three of Selene's epicenter events and highly recommend them so when we can get there again we should go. Selene. Well, thank you for that very warm introduction and it's such an honor to be here, Simon. Thank you so much for including me and um, I love that you all are doing this work on our regenerative future. 
Um, my focus presently is continuing that work of bringing people together, but pivoting to much more of an online focus. We're going to be launching a new series called Regenerative Rising, and we're focusing very much on bringing uh, all those sectors that Simon mentioned, but into a deep focus on how do we rebuild post-COVID based on everything that we're learning about the deep insecurities in our food system, the deep inequities in our society, and how do we start to be very purposeful in designing forward with those kind of all these large systems in mind. Uh, I loved what has been said already about regenerative. My addition to what I think regenerative, a framework for how to think about regenerative is that it's a living systems based way of seeing the land and the land should be perceived in place where it is. It's a place source system. Therefore, what you do in New Zealand versus what you do in the Great Plains of the US and what you do in tropical uh, environs are all unique and different. And that is the power of this approach because you're looking at what is going to create the highest level of evolutional capacity for that land to be its best self. Exactly, that's great, Selene. And that's why the big, uh, big monocultures and the big ag systems, they don't like this new system because it's, <laughs> it's unique and tailored and specific, you know. Um, all boats rise with the tide. We're going to move on to Sam. Sam is one of New Zealand's leaders in Regen Ag and following international farm systems research, now works with a wide range of farmers, practitioners, scientists, entrepreneurs, supporting grassroots networks to transform our farm and food systems to deliver greater ecological and human well-being. Sam is a co-founder of the rapidly growing farm network group Quorum Sense. He's also going to be a co-author with Dr. Gwen Grillet on an upcoming white paper that looks at the opportunities and challenges for regenerative ag in New Zealand. So we look forward to that in maybe six months. But Sam, over to you. Welcome. Well, thanks, Simon. And uh, great to be here. Uh, yeah, so my, my work uh, at the moment sort of has two main parallel streams. Um, I didn't uh, found Quorum Sense, but I got on board early uh, and I'm now effectively managing uh, the, the network on, be on behalf of the group. Um, what we're working on at the moment is, is kind of grow the support network so that we can support as many farmers as possible across different farms throughout the country, just with, you know, really practical farmer to farmer knowledge, knowledge sharing and learning and sort of supporting farmers to help each other innovate and adapt ideas and practices um, to those different contexts that have been mentioned. Um, and the other sort of parallel stream, which is nicely tied in with that, is yeah, working with Dr. Gwen Grele from Manaki Whenua and a whole lot of other scientists and um, agribusinesses and practitioners to um, yeah, kind of complement that on the ground farmer practice with some of the, those other kind of knowledge systems in terms of science um, in particular and actually try and bridge those two together into a, into a pretty cool partnership. So exciting stuff at the moment. Um, and uh, obviously I, that last week I gave my sort of personal definition of regenerative and there was a question on the Quorum Sense Facebook page uh, uh, last week, I think it was asking around what people's definitions were. And I picked up one that I really liked, um, which I've adapted slightly and it was from uh, Maury Leyland Penno uh, was the original. Um, and I'll just read it out here. Uh, regenerative farming is the application of an ecological approach to the agricultural landscape with a particular focus on the health of our soils, plants, animals, and people, and an ex expectation of similar or improved profitability. It encourages a, a mindset of continuous improvement, takes into account that every farm and farmer is different, and recognizes the connection between the health of our farms and the health and resilience of our communities, waterways, biodiversity, and climate. And um, yeah, I sort of particularly liked that one, so I just thought I'd share it with you all. Cheers. Thanks, Sam. That was fantastic, and and we're we're really happy that's recorded, so people can like look back on this and 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 work through that themselves. Erin, um, with a foot in both both you know the north 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 uh, North America and and New Zealand, how do you what's the view from from Canada, and how does that compare to New Zealand? Hmm. Same, same, but different. It's interesting. Um, and it, that could be said of the world over. So right now there's two different things happening in North America. Well, there's 
two different systems that we're working with. There's a lot of um, pasture-based um, animal integration, so bison and beef and sheep, but we have a huge arable crop um, farming industry in North America, much larger than here in, in New Zealand. And so the opportunities are very, very different. Um, right now there's Gabe Brown working with the Soil Health Academy and doing a lot of work on arable landscapes, and that has taken on a huge amount of traction, which might not be as relevant in New Zealand because there's not as much arable um, landscape, but what is happening in New Zealand with the grassland and what Quorum Sense has going in really ramping up the understanding of how those um, systems can work is something that's very interesting to me for in North America. Um, in Canada, we have a lot of interest in how to increase the regeneration of grasslands and then link that to outcomes so that we can get policy shifting, but we have not yet cracked this really um, sticky peer-to-peer -peer interaction that's starting to happen really rapidly here in New Zealand, which is really exciting. That's, that's really interesting. Um, could you just talk a little bit, just for a, a little bit more on that policy shifting that you, you see starting to happen in, in, in both North America and, and here? What are the opportunities? Could you just touch on yeah, that? Yeah, so briefly? we're finding that, you bet. So um, right now everybody is chasing carbon and how to measure carbon. And although that's a very nice shiny thing, of course, ecological systems have all of these different ecosystem functions, mineral cycling, water cycling, all of these different things that make a healthy system. Um, and so we are really curious as to how farmers can be taking the measurements and monitor how those ecosystem processes are improving and then use that data to show how that would increase or, um, resilience for flood and drought situations, things that governments in both places are having to spend a lot of money on to see how those monitoring and measurements can then flow to other financial mechanisms for farmers. Okay, great. Nicole, would you like to comment on that? Um, and, and also, and, and secondary to that uh, comment, um, to Erin's statement, just talk about the, what's happening where you are in Idaho, Montana, and you've been to New Zealand recently, and you travel around mm -hmm. Australia. Just give us a little yep. bit of an overview of those different areas, what's happening? It's, it's a really fascinating time, and I think it's a fascinating time from so many different aspects. It's, I mean, you could call it the perfect storm, if that wasn't a cheesy thing to say, is to see the pressures that are coming on to producers from so many different angles and seeing some really interesting conversations from, um, let's say, traditional industrial agriculture farmers who are really asking these questions about how do we farm into the future and, and really starting to they're not using the word ecosystem services, but that's what's coming through, which is how do we build resilience? How do we build a sponge? Um, what do we do about fire? Um, you know, I was on Kangaroo Island when COVID kind of broke out and, you know, popped all my way over to Montana to, to get out of there. But looking at, you know, what is happening in Australia right now, and they say this isn't, um, we don't have fire seasons anymore, we just have fire. Um, how do we produce food into the future with climactic variability and with the breakdowns that are happening in terms of marketplace. And I think here in the US, it's really, I don't know what's happening in New Zealand right now, but it's really coming to the forefront about what's happening in terms of how do we get food to people? You know, what are the breakdowns and along the way? And I think we need to be thinking regeneratively um, is that real whole big picture of, of how do we supply good quality food to people um, where the farmer themselves is actually being remunerated and not being propped up artificially. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, so Lane, you're probably good to, to add, add a comment on the, on the back of that for, as someone who weaves together, you know, b business people and farmers, growers, uh, soil practitioners, ecologists, um, advocacy groups like, uh, you know, um, carbon underground and I mean some really cool stuff. So how do you see what's what's happening where you are in the interplay with all of all of these different people in the space? Well, it's it's interesting. I think a lot of what has what Nicole just said is really accurate, especially given what we've seen with COVID and all of the I guess the underbelly of how our food system is very vulnerable to disruption. Uh, you can still go into grocery stores and still see a lot of um, things not on the shelves. Um, as far as what's happening in business and where is the conversation right now, uh, I, it's, there's, a, there's some contraction and there's also some conflict around how a lot of the CPGs that were in sort of their gasping for breath 
uh, leading up to COVID have had an extraordinary resurgence in your very conventional um, grocery types of items uh, from the craft types of products and uh, those things that were losing footing have gained. So I, there's an interesting question that I'm hearing a lot of people talk about right now is, well, what does this portend in terms of the conversation we were having pre-COVID that was moving toward this deeper consideration about how farming is happening? And I think there's a lot of dysfunction that is going to require an even greater effort on the part of those of us who want to see systemic change. There's, I perceive some rising up of pushback. There's been some interesting departures of some of the most influential people in some very big companies of late. So I'm, I'm mildly concerned about what that portends. Nicole, did you want to comment to that? Oh, uh, thinking from the New Zealand context. Yeah. Well, look, well, for, yeah. Do, do we? Did you? I thought were you maybe going to respond to that? What Selene was talking about there, or? Um, I was tuning out because I was thinking about what CPG meant, Selene. No, I wonder too. What does CPG mean? Oh, I'm so sorry. Consumer packaged goods. So those yeah. are, you know, all the processed food on the shelves. It, those are CPG companies, consumer packaged oh. goods. Oh, okay. I thank oh, you. Guys. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I thought sorry. everybody knew that. <laughs> no, we'll put that acronym on our list. Um, hey, sorry. Sam, uh, we'll, we'll jump back over to Sam. Just, Sam, what, what's the lay of the land in New Zealand? And what are, what are some of the challenges that we're facing now? And, and, and if you could sort of, because it's always about food, because we're food producers too. They say 40 million people, and we talk about value add and commodity. So just talk about, in essence, we farm, you know, what, what, what are the challenges we're facing here in New Zealand? What's the lay of the land? Oh, um, big question, Simon. Um, I guess the, I was just thinking when, when Salim was talking before about, um, you know, that this kind of alongside the conversation around regenerative egg at the moment there's also this parallel conversation which has maybe been going a bit longer around resilience and what resilience looks like at, at a landscape scale at community scale and that and i was thinking about how you know a lot of new zealand had this um this summer had this really nasty combination of drought and COVID at the same time and for a livestock producer that meant um, being short on feed and combined with the impact of the processing plants um you know at around half capacity, which meant that people couldn't get rid of stock, which is still having um, ongoing effects in terms of, uh, I think one of the latest example was dairy farmers with cull cows that, um, that, they, that they can't get rid of like they usually would early enough, um, which is putting pressure on feed. And lots of the um, anecdotes that were coming around of, you know, all of the, all of the farmers that have been, um, I guess, whether you want to call it regenerative grazing or planned grazing or, or, or trying to build resilience into their grazing systems in terms of um, being able to withstand that, have really noticed that they, they grew pasture longer into the summers. They, were, they managed to maintain animal condition um, better than they used to. And when the rain did come, they really bounced back a lot faster. And that this is all just their observations and looking at how their farms are performing versus the, you know, the, neighbor, the neighbor's place, um, which might've been grazed a bit harder and longer. Um, relatively speaking. And I think it was just a, um, you know, just a really great example of what resilience looks like. And in this case, it was a double whammy um, of, of unforeseen events um, and the ability to bounce back, which is what resilience is all about. Um, so I think what, uh, what's going to be really interesting seeing these conversations kind of come together and it's not one or the other, it's not a, is it a regenerative thing, it's a resilient thing, it's actually those concepts are, are really woven together. Um, and I think one of our challenges at the moment is just around language and communication and understanding. And that's really what we're, um, you know, as the sort of regenerative agriculture conversation has gained more traction at, at higher levels, there's been a lot of people really trying to make meaning of what, of what that means and, um, and sort out the, the claims from the, from the reality and what is, Ameri is it, is it American style regenerative in New Zealand or is it, um, 
you know, what does this look like on the ground? What's actually making the difference? And there's been a real lack of um, specifics. So everyone's been talking in generalizations and I think um, it's, it's time that we get specific about what we're talking about. Um, and that's where the conversations between the farmers and practitioners that are kind of operating at ground level and um, people in, in industry and government and science, for example, um, that's where those conversations, um, I'm excited that they're starting to happen, yeah. Right, okay, good. Yeah, um, that, that's, I mean, we, we, let's get to the soil then because the, the, you know, what's, what's growing and we talk about deep, deep rooting, um, you know, uh, forages. Um, Aaron, there was a quote in, in one of your, uh, in your contributor article, it's not a question of whether we should stop raising meat and dairy or whether we adopt plant-based diets, but rather a question of how we manage the land. Ruminant animals grazing on deep-rooted pasture are essential for carbon sequestration. Can you talk a little bit about that in relation to what Sam was talking about with the resilience in, in, the, in the droughts? Because droughts are not immune to New Zealand. They're also in uh, all these other countries. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you bet. So um, part of the understanding of regenerative agriculture is also that every landscape and, and area is different. And so, I mean, what, you, and what ends up happening in Taranaki will be very different than what happens in Hawke's Bay. If you put the same principles in play in both areas, you're gonna have very different outcomes, which means that these systems have to be really nimble and adaptive to be able to work for whatever the environment is and the communities want and are the desires of the people there on the landscapes. So where I am from in the Canadian prairies, we have a very brittle tending environment. So we have long periods of time where there's no rainfall, there's no precipitation. So in those areas, they traditionally were not treed areas. It was all grasslands. And those grasslands require huge herds of ruminant animals moving over them to be able to lay down that grass, armor the soil, get the nutrient cycles going and keep that biodiversity happening. New Zealand's a very different situation. The whole country was, what was it? 85% in forest before um, human habitation. So as we've been changing the landscapes, it changes the environments of those, meaning you'll have to be more nimble in the different systems that you bring in. So for some cases, it means animals on grasslands allow that deep rooting. You can have really high biodiversity of grasses as opposed to arable agriculture, which might just be a monocrop and cause more um, runoff or you know, less holding capacity of water, depending on how you do it. So both, both systems, whether you're doing animal or um, plant-based agriculture can be helpful or harmful and all of it is in the adaptability of how it works. So just like the resilience of food systems means of diversity of different um, options that will create a diverse supply chain, so, so is so for diversity of farming operations. So making sure that we have those really diverse systems that can be adapted based on what is needed in those areas. Okay, great. Nicole, you talk about that in your contributor article you say many people talk about regenerative agriculture like it's this new thing, but that's doing a great disservice to indigenous people around the world. They've mm -hmm. been regenerating the land for hundreds of years. The Maori worldview is inherently regenerative. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I don't think it's hundreds of years. I think we're talking thousands of years. And I think um, one example might be the Hopi people, you know, looking at some of their their management or what was happening in China before the industrial revolution, you know, some of the methodologies that they developed. But I think in New Zealand, when you look at some of the most fertile and valuable and beautiful lands in, in New Zealand, um, particularly around the Auckland area, um, those were developed through some extraordinary market gardening that the Maori people were doing and pretty much you know, Europeans come in, they colonize, they destroy what those people were working on and then, you know, turn that into maybe, you know, production land. You know, it's where we grow our onions and grow some of New Zealand's most productive um, landscapes. And yet there was no, um, there's nothing offered in terms of acknowledging who came before and what they were doing with their land management. And some of those uh, garden beds would have been 600 years old, um, you know, an extraordinary deep soil for, compared to landscapes that would have just been in um, trees, you know, and, and, and I think that's part of, you know, regenerative agriculture is not going back in time, but it's also acknowledging what has come before and then looking at what are some of the best science that we're seeing, what is um, some of this molecular science, what are we seeing in terms of diversity and biological and plant communication and how can we enhance that? And so I think with regenerative, we're really bringing the best of all of those worlds together in terms of how do we actually increase these outcomes for landscapes? Great. 
Um, I'll come to you in one second, Selene, with a different question. But Sam, I'd like you just to comment on this thread. Um, when you did your research overseas um, and you'd come back with, with your, after your Nuffield Scholar uh, you know, work, you said, once I'd seen a few living examples of farmers doing things that conventional agronomists tell us aren't possible, regenerative farming became pretty convincing. What were some of those things that you saw on your travels and, and you brought back home? Um, it was actually, uh, the, the two examples that spring to mind were both um, kind of intensive vegetable production systems actually. Um, one in New York State and one in uh, Ecuador up, up near Quito in the, in the highlands there. And effectively both of those farmers on, uh, actually both on 10 hectares um, had, had bought their land in an incredibly degraded state. Uh, in the case of the New York State farmer, it, was, it had been corn on corn on corn with the odd soy for 40, 50, 60 years, high tillage, high input. It was like concrete. Um, and the uh, farmer in Ecuador, it was basically just a rocky, alpine, barren landscape with no water. Um, and both of those farmers took on a I suppose they, they were organic, um, organic biodynamic -y inclined, although that wasn't, again, it wasn't a prescription so much as just sort of community of practice that they were working with. And to, to use the example of the New York farmer, um, when he first broke, it, broke in that ground, he, he couldn't pull more than one subsoiler through at a time. It was that hard. Um, he tried to and he kept on breaking things by, through a combination of, multi-species cover crops on half the farm and growing veggies on the other half of the farm each year and grazing those with, you know, you only had six or, ten, six or 10 cattle or something on five hectares, just grazing those cover crops. Um, he turned that soil, we dug holes and it was feet of chocolatey black. Um, so despite actually quite a high tillage system um, and I was grilling him on, you know, the inputs that he had been putting in and that kind of stuff. And it was um, seed and rock dust. Um, you know, seed seed for the multi-species cover crops and the, and the vegetable um, in the seed, sorry, and um, rock dust for, for certain trace minerals that were missing um, and letting the biology do the rest of the work in terms of breaking that up. And I, you know, one example of that doesn't, isn't probably isn't that convincing, but once you come across a few and you, you see these patterns and you're like, wow, there's something going on here. And it was really that kind of um, treating the soil as a living organism and understanding how to feed it um, and, and, and that kind of, starting that upward spiral um, and yeah that was probably those, those would be the key ones that came to mind there. Okay I was going to just stick this thread just one more little bit um, uh, Selene I'll come to you but um, just Aaron I thought maybe you could comment on this a question came in from Gemma Carroll um, possibly the greatest challenge on the horizon in New Zealand will be waterway protection and regional council regulation pressuring farmers interestingly enough vegetable growers have huge nutrient leaching issues could this be an opportunity for Regen to work with government and farmers? Is that what, what do you say about that? Yes. That was a short. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, when you think of who who's managing the landscapes in all of our countries, it, it is farmers. It's it's everybody who's um, in agriculture, and of course, we all need to be working together. This is and it isn't just what I love about the Regen movement is that this huge spectrum of people on the farm on the on the it's a huge spectrum. And as people get into it and move in, they're finding different ways and moving in, in the great and amazing directions. They're finding new ways of doing things. Yeah. And so I get stuck on this science thing because of course we need proof, but how much proof do we need, right? There's all of these in-person things that everyone is seeing and it's working, it's working for farmers and it's adaptive. So you can't repeat trials in all these different places. They won't work the same way in every year in every place. So that's where there's a little bit of a, a push up against to be able to work with government, we need to have this proof, but how much proof do we need in an adaptive system? So I always liken it to raising a child. If you have 10 kids and you follow the exact same system of how you raise them every day, will that work? Will every child successfully be an adult that is well-balanced and you know, happy and healthy? No, because there's too, ma too much complexity. There's too many different things. As a parent, you have to be adaptive in how you're raising your children based on their needs and the environment and a million different factors. Same holds true for regenerative farming. Mm, great, awesome. I'm going to shift tag to over to Selene with a with a twofold sort of question, Selene. And um, 
uh, what, there's been a few questions in from our audience um, offshore asking about networks in, in the US to, to join up and, and talk about. You could just maybe talk about your network, I think, in response to that. But I'd be really interested to know, um, and maybe our audience didn't see it, uh, but there was a, a blog that went out last week from the World Resources Institute that, that stated agricultural soils have minimal potential to sequester global greenhouse gas emissions. This was refuted um, by some significant um, soil ecologists, Dr. Keith Paustian and Ratan Lal. Um, and that, that's a great paper. And if people want to get hold of that, it's part of a global soil uh, sequestering uh, carbon and soil listserv that we're part of. Reach out to Pure Advantage and we'll, and we'll get you in touch on that. But, but Nicole, could you, uh, sorry, Celine, could you talk please about the networks that are available to you and, and how they maybe responded to that very high level discussion that went around last week? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, there's a lot of organizations in the states that are holding different pieces of this complex fabric. There are organizations like Mad Agriculture, which is doing work directly with farmers, helping them reimagine their farm plan from a regenerative lens. There's Kiss the Ground that's working to educate the public and how to talk about the power of soil as part of this larger um, potentiality for addressing climate change. There's At the Epicenter and uh, we're actually in the process of being part of a group of folks that will be launching an online community that will be sort of like a, a regenerative ag Facebook, if you will. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we'll share that with you. I would love to have Pure Advantage participate so we can really build a, a very interactive global community that are talking to each other, cross-pollinating with each other, because that's going to be something we really need to combat the disinformation and this type of thing that came out from the WRI. And uh, as when we were talking a little bit before we got on this call, um, I sent out a comment to that group because I have been um, disturbed by the hyper focus on carbon. It's a very reductionistic way of approaching the complexity that we're talking about. And Aaron, I loved what you were saying earlier about the multi systems measurement. And we, we have a lot of expertise to do that already. We can uh, determine if we have high uh, bioactivity in soil. We can measure for increasing uh, organic matter in soil. There, we can see indicators above ground that tell us we are having an impact. We can learn so much from just uh, observational uh, skills that all humans have. And so to have added the shiny bauble of that we have to have a whole new system that we need to invent new markets that we need to uh, be able to measure specifically for carbon and no one can agree how that is done for me is an obstacle that is in fact stopping us from moving with great alacrity forward to help bring these new approach, not as everyone said new, but new for many farmers to think about their, their place as um, a whole present organism that they have a relationship to. And also how do we help those farmers have diverse cropping systems, have other types of things moving through their landscape by having animals part of their ecosystem they will then have potentially a far more resilient financial foundation to stand on. So I have become impassioned about pushing back against the hypercarbon conversation. I think car we're carbon-based life. Carbon is not our enemy, it's, it's our ally. It's just misappropriated, it's in the wrong place. And we really need to work on restoring ecosystem harmony and balance and that will set things right and in the proper uh, direction. And what's so beautiful, as all of us know, thank you, Erin, <laughs> as all of us know, you know, life is amazingly resilient. If we just give it a gentle amount of support and get out of the way, I think what we're going to find is like a cascade that is quite extraordinary in working with humanity to heal the 
the damage we've been doing. And that needs to be coupled with shifting away from fossil fuel energy and a host of other ills. But this way of thinking we have to measure for one thing is really, uh, it's reductionistic, it's anti-regenerative in every aspect of what regeneration means. That, that, that's awesome. And Sam, I mean, you, you would have to uh, respond to that. Uh, that is exactly what you're, you and Dr. Grillet and others are working on, right? Yep. No, um, so Lynn, you sort of summed up our entire project quite nicely there. Um, just, to, just to cap it off so people are aware. So um, the Alana Water National Science Challenge and the Next Foundation have partnered um, to fund um, Gwen from Manaki Whenua Research and I to run a a small project developing what we're calling a regenerative outcome framework. And that's really just trying to help set out um, the kind of the part of it's about outcomes and indicators um, specific to New Zealand. So what does a regenerative system look like in New Zealand? How does it differ by context in terms of region, soil type, farm system, etc.? And what are the different things that people like, let's get specific about what we actually want to know about um, regenerative systems or about farm systems or, or landscapes in general like what are we wanting these these systems to deliver and so that's part of our kind of um, canvassing work where we kind of try to take quite a participatory approach to bringing in you know farmers scientists practitioners bankers investors um, the works and then making sure that we can really specifically address that so rather but and rather than delivering just a um, kind of a framework just for science and policy we're also trying to deliver something that would really help a, um, a marketing company, for example, navigate um, what regenerative might mean to their consumers and, and their producers and try and marry that so that they can actually communicate and articulate with a degree of integrity and robustness in terms of the data that sits behind those claims that they're making. Same with a farmer. Um, you know, everyone's got different tools, different resources. Um, so we're really trying to kind of bring together these different knowledge systems and create some kind of common understanding um, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be the, the one definition um, for New Zealand that lots of people are asking for, but it's going to go a really long way to helping kind of describe what that means to different people and how we can actually um, collect, you know, understand these things with some degree of common language. So right. yeah, that's, um, that's kind of just kicking off now and um, hoping to wrap up by November. Okay, great. Fantastic. We, look, we all look forward to that. Um, Ralph Gray had just commented, uh, no, this is not a question, but Ralph Gray had commented that CPG or consumer packaged goods uh, in, the, in North America is referred to as FMCG here in New Zealand. So fast moving consumer goods, either, either way, they just sound awful and I don't want to eat them. But um, so let's talk about, um, Nicole, what are the opportunities for New Zealand farmers? And say, what are three things um, those leading the industry leading the change in the industry could do to scale so three things that people so what's the biggest opportunity for regenerative ag in or in, in new zealand so we're seeing some just fantastic conversations that are really being driven by those that are closer to the consumers which is um, some of the brands so looking at what's happening with new zealand merino i think is incredibly exciting um, i think the opportunity is we already have, uh, there is already this view of New Zealand in terms of clean and green. And I think the regenerative approach really means that we can stand on a foundation of integrity. And I think um, a lot of us are aware that there, you know, there's some issues around integrity of, of seeing New Zealand as clean and green. I mean, really, we just were the, one of the last places to have industrial agriculture applied to it. Um, so we're seeing a lag in terms of the degradation and seeing what's happening in terms of you know water quality and other issues you know um but i think so what was the question three things that we can change three yeah, what, are, what are three things that those leading the change in the industry could do to scale like just just yeah we'll go around the we'll go around the panel for that for three things that that we could do to scale this uh, this change this movement yeah, I mean, it, it's really interesting because it is something that if we look at trying to scale it in terms of trying to make, um, you know, a one size fits all model is that so much of this comes from the ground up. And it is like Aaron's been reflecting in terms of being adaptive and nimble is, um, and, and this is where I think it comes back to having farmer hubs and farmer groups and, and getting in behind farmers instead of what's currently happening in New Zealand, which is a real 
reaction and a pushback and uh, no, it's not possible or no, this is different to the US or Australia or the, you know, the whole show me your data, um, as opposed to getting really curious and having a sense of wonder of how is it that we have dairy farmers in New Zealand that are using less than 20 units of nitrogen and are profitable? You know, get really curious about that instead of going, oh, no, no, we can't do it in New Zealand. And so I think the thing for scaling is we have structural, um, so we have structural systems in New Zealand that are actually limiting innovation instead of getting interested in and, and trying to defend the status quo. Okay, all right, we know we have a water quality issue. Yes, we know that New Zealand is number three in terms of phosphate use. All right, we know that there's all these different things going on and going, okay, well, what would it look like if it didn't look like that instead of just defending what we already know? So I think that would be my other point, but I'd like to hear from the others. Okay, I might just stick with that just for a second and, and open it up to um, Aaron and Sam in the New Zealand context. It's a question from Angus Gordon. Much of the discussion about regenerative ag is around landscapes of low slope that have been overworked by machines over multiple crop rotations. What is the mechanism that farmers of hill soils that are too steep for cultivation as well as being very erodible and young can use, given that these landscapes tend to have low productivity, grass squads that tend to smother out diversity and not promote it. What are your thoughts to that? Oh, so, this, is, this is my favorite topic. Um, I'm a hill country farming, uh, what I spent four and a half years doing and looking forward to getting back there when I can. Um, look, the, to be fair, there's nothing um, particularly flashy about um, managing uh, hill country in a regenerative fashion, you know, 80, 90% of it's still management and decision making. Um, there's actually, um, on the Quorum Sense YouTube, we recorded a webinar with Hamish Bielski talking about um, post route um, resilience and that kind of stuff. And that covers that off in a bit more detail um, if, if anyone's really interested. But, you know, just understanding the that relationship between soil plants and animals in terms of their respective health and performance. And I think what's, you know, these tools around using higher density, short duration, adequate recovery grazing, grazing systems that are still really animal performance and therefore animal health focused, but are working with, um, with the kind of seasonal variation of, you know, growth and, and, and pastures and using animal impact as a tool, um, it's not, I'm not, it's kind of hard to, <laughs> I struggle to put, put this into words, but what, what hill country farms are observing is when, you know, it's to an extent it's rotational grazing. You could, you could call it that, but it's actually applying, it brings that adaptive piece, ad, adaptive element in and understanding, you know, the, that whole kind of concept of plant competition. Um, if you change the way that you manage and you observe, uh, you know, every, every farm's got its little quirks and it's like, oh, why is that paddock behaving slightly differently compared to the one next door, despite they were saying, what, what did I do with my management differently in the last, you know, six months or a couple of years that might have affected that? Because the, um, you know, the opportunities about how different plant species are collaborating and how you can actually utilize different species in different seasons um, and actually having, and so it becomes a collaboration, not a competition. Mm. Um, and you know, for example, the, um, there's quite a few farmers starting to use high density grazing um, on sort of steep north faces in particular um, during rain events to try and get a little bit of gentle pugging to try and actually create a, um, a texture on the landscape, I guess you'd call it, that actually traps water and helps it infiltrate more so you can actually grow, um, you know, so you hold more moisture, you grow more grass. Um, and so thinking about yeah, I mean, the, there's, a, there's a pretty active grazing um, conversation starting to emerge. Um, the Quorum Sense Facebook group's one place. Um, but it's definitely possible. And there's a whole lot of other things we can do looking at um, obviously backing off the things that might be harmful to the soil ecology. Um, and that, and Nicole's done some cool work around just getting that fungal bacterial balance right and helping soils kind of retain their structure and, and actually repair their infiltration capacity. Um, yeah first and foremost. So Nicole would probably be better to, to speak to that kind of stuff, but. Okay, cool. Um, Aaron, do you want to talk about any of the hill, hill country or uh, unusual terrain for uh, regenerative agriculture? I think Sam pretty much covered that, but um, I just came back from the East Cape. So I was up near um, Uwawa, Tolga Bay and Gisborne. 
which is hill country that has been infiltrated by monocrop pine forest. And it is a horror just driving through those areas, seeing um, how the landscape has just been ravaged by these monocrop forests that when they're cut, um, just devastate whole communities. And in that nimble adaptive nature, um, there's all, the, all these other opportunities. So of course, yes, totally agree with what Sam is saying. There's all of these different management solutions to hill country grazing. And there's also the opportunity to replant native bush and to see how we can start figuring out what are really marginal lands that really should never have been cleared in the first place. And how can we get finance and support and flow those supports through to landowners and land managers so that they can make that choice while still providing all these ecosystem services for their communities. So I think one of the um, barriers or one of the things that could be useful for scaling this movement is figuring out how to fund all of these management solutions because government and industry love trying tech solutions for these management problems. And we need more funding for outreach and peer-to-peer -peer learning and education and all of these different grassroots management needs and tools so that people can make those choices adaptively that are most useful for their contexts. Right, fantastic. Um, Selene, I'll come to you in a second. Uh, that was an awesome answer. Um, you know, just to, to, we're going to take our audience on a little bit of a journey in the next few weeks. We have some more episodes on regenerative organics. We have something around um, resilience and drought. And we're looking to talk about um, native forestry, regeneration and forestry and how that works with the land with, with Dame Anne Salmond and Dr. David Hall on the, on the panel. It's going to be a fantastic uh, webisode in a few weeks. Um, so Lane, we had a question, um, the CPG thing keeps cropping up, but what were the reasons for the fragility of the farm to table uh, and the renewed emergence of CPG processes? What, 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 how's, what's your comment about that? Well, I, I'm not certain I am the most adept at answering that question. That's an excellent question. And I think it's not clear whether or not the, the farm to table is, is failing. I think, you know, when you've added the complexity of social distancing, farmers markets, many are not happening. I know like in our community, it's an online farmers market. I know that the consumer supported agriculture CSAs have just exponentially increased in people purchasing a share to be able to take advantage of that local harvest. Um, but the constraint on um, that being part of people's normative notion of how they get food, I think the panic that ensued with the whole uh, lockdown, COVID, stay in place types of scenarios, a lot of people who had depended on eating out found themselves eating in at home and they really weren't well equipped to cook their own meals. So they went back to a lot of old standbys that they were familiar with. That is some of the arguments that I have been listening to of different colleagues about kind of trying to tease out what are some of the reasons that we've seen suddenly this huge uptick in the sales of things that were plummeting precipitously and also all of the challenges that have happened for local food. And um, interestingly, I've been asked to review an article on this topic, uh, what, whether or not some of the funding that happened in the United States during the government's uh, distribution of capital also had some serious issues in terms of getting money to smaller farm producers to make sure they had resources to bring people on to do or planting at the appropriate time. So it's complex and it's been, um, again, there's a lot for us to learn from this and I think we're still all gonna be unpacking from the different signals that we're getting from the community. And one thing I just wanted to throw in, it's not precisely what we're talking about today, but I think it's worth having all of us be considering is how are we helping really bridge the gap to the people who are the real investors in our food systems? That's who buys the food. Um, the amount of money that 
moves through uh, we the citizens of the world to the foods that we have in our, our on our tables it's massive it's we're talking trillions and trillions of dollars and we need to really help lift the bar of considering for people to align what their deeper value propositions are around what they say they really want and are they investing in a way that will support that as the systems that we have. And I think that's gonna be an interesting, I, I like shifting the notion that we're consumers to we are investors. We are investing and we need to think of ourselves as investors and uh, why is this regenerative and organic conversation about how food is, um, how we're trying to get the food system to uh, evolve itself towards this approach, why it matters beyond just the carbon conversation. It matters for nutrient dense food, which is lacking in huge ways all over this planet from a lot of bad um, lack of honoring soil as life. Fantastic. That, that's, that's a really good, good summation of that question with a much wider lens. Um, we've got a few minutes to go. I'd like to go around now and um, Ask each one of you, uh, what, are the, what, what is a challenge that you're facing right now in the work you're doing? And how, how can we overcome that challenge by working together across borders? So how about I start, how about I send it back to you, Selene? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, that that is directly what my focus is right now is how do we become more collaborative and coordinated throughout the world for those of us who are really sitting on top of this this large ecosystem of conversation and how broad this is because interestingly you know regenerative agriculture is a subset of regeneration and regeneration is such a beautiful word and it holds so much promise for giving us um, some new ways of attending to we as human beings towards one another and we as human beings uh, toward our living planet. Uh, there's a, a quote I'd like to read to you um, by Dr. Danella Meadows, who said, she's a, a very influential envir environmental thinker from the 20th century. The world is a complex, interconnected, finite, ecological, social, psychological, economic system. We treat it as if it were not, as if it were divisible, separable, simple, and infinite. Our persistent, intractable global problems arise directly from the mismatch. So we are holding in this regenerative conversation sort of the reawakening of, the, of humanity to the fact that we're in this complex, interconnected, finite, ecological, social, psychological, economic system. And if we can lean into that, it will elicit from us new responses that I think will be very meaningful over the next um, several decades. Fantastic, thank you so much. Sam, uh, just quickly, we've got a few minutes left. We'll go around the rest of the panel. Challenge and opportunity. Um, I'm going to go quite um, very, very personal here. Challenge is time. Um, the, this conversation's grown so fast, um, and a lot of us have been putting in, uh, sort of been involved in it for a long time with a lot of voluntary effort. Um, and now, you know, there's myself and, and quite a few others who are. Um, you know, have, have all these relationships and networks and um, experience that we've been building up over time that are now kind of being called and demanded for um, much more. And um, the just from a from a real personal perspective, it's like how do we how do we build um, like really effective teams um, to operate and you know support because my my whole driver is how do we support as many people as possible through um, you know um, safe and exciting and and fun and successful transitions um, to wherever they want to get to. Um, and that's not, um, yeah, between the, between the work with Quorum Sense and, and the science, um, that's getting quite demanding. And so just trying to figure out how we can creatively um, build teams. And it's kind of that awkward, awkward stage between, um, you know, where there's that, so, so still some questions around legitimacy from um, the, I suppose, 
places that typically have a lot of resources and power um, and that takes a lot of investment and energy and time to, to have those conversations while also trying to support the grassroots communities at the same time so um, that's kind of the, the teething phase we're in at the moment um, and the opportunity um, yeah I think there's just a far more mature conversation um, and, and, and kind of the the connectedness between all of the different conversations that are going on, whether it's the post COVID um, kind of stuff in food systems or health or, um, you know, economics, local food system resilience, uh, et cetera. Once we start to see and piece those, those things together, um, you know, the, the different skills and perspectives that people are bringing into the same room. Um, that's what's really exciting me at the moment. And that, that's what I think is going to be really cool going forward. Fantastic. Well, I'm seeing that surge with all of us here talking and working together. Um, 45 seconds, Aaron, uh, challenge and opportunity. Challenges, how much proof is enough proof so we can stop filling in all these bloody funding applications that make me want to scream. Like we just need to get money flowing down to get this stuff happening. We know it works. Uh, biggest opportunity is that there's a paradigm shift coming. So we need to be, I am operating from the, we are in a new paradigm. We have to be operating from that if we're wanting to usher the new one in forward, which means sharing all information, sharing all networks, tools, funding opportunities, not holding anything close for each individual or organization or farm or country, because we're all in this sinking ship together. We need to move ahead and behave as though the new paradigm is here. Fantastic. Thank you. Nicole, 45 seconds, challenge and opportunity. Uh, the new paradigm is here. I live and breathe it. And th that is the, like, all I see is opportunity right now. And we cannot, like Sam says, we cannot keep up with this wave. So our biggest challenge is capacity building. And we hope to launch a train the trainers course next year, because this is what I'm seeing is some of the handholding in terms of, you know, large scale, big operations that are wanting to transition that are concerned about risk. Um, really have a concern about, you know, what are those first steps? And because it is so context specific, you need people on the ground that can really see what are those steps for people. So, yeah, we, I mean, we would like some funding for that, but it's not going to stop me. So, yeah, certainly the Train the Trainers course will be, hope it, well, no, hopefully it will be rolling next year. Woohoo! Fantastic. Hey, look, on that note, um, look, regeneration is about allowing nature's chaos to reach its harmony, and in so doing, we as humans find ways to thrive within that. So with that, we'll have to call it quits today. Um, as always, these webisodes are available at pureadvantage.org and EHF and Pure Advantage YouTube channels. Big thanks to this uh, panel and Alina behind the scenes and Ursula and Polly. Um, keep an eye out for some additional programming coming up around organics, regen ag, resilience, and regenerative forestry. Please sign up for our Webisode 6 next week, Investing in Regen Ag with business journalist and author Rod Oram, Mike Taitoko of Toha Calm the Farm, and Jeff and Justine Ross of Lake Hawea Station. With that, Kakiti Ano, see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Bye. See ya. Bye.